was a moment very few thought would happen. Iran brought in from the cold after decades of frosty diplomatic relations with a deal between the country, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany to gradually lift crippling economic sanctions in exchange for Tehran curbing its nuclear program. In many ways, US President Barack Obama staked part of his foreign policy legacy on it. Iran's reformist leadership was elected largely on the promise of reducing international isolation. And so far, the deal has held, and in return, the nuclear-related sanctions have become history. $100 billion of its frozen assets are now thawing, and Iran has reconnected to the global financial system. Iran has one of the largest populations in the region. More than half are under the age of 30. And now, since the sanctions were lifted, they expect jobs and economic opportunities. In the past year, the government has been courted by foreign companies keen to sign their own deals. The first of 100 Airbus A321s touched down in Tehran this month. But that delivery appears to be an exception rather than the rule. Because as Iran has discovered, attracting more business and collecting payments is proving difficult. While the nuclear-related sanctions were lifted, they didn't give Iran a blank slate. Other sanctions, like the US restriction on dollar trades with Iran, remain in place, which has scared off many international banks. And that's contributing to the sense that the deal's benefits aren't trickling down quickly enough to the pockets of ordinary Iranians. The region is safer. Germany and the United States are safer. Europe is safer. Israel is safer. And the world is safer because Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon were blocked the deal has curbed Iran's capability to develop nuclear weapons. But critics say the fact that it doesn't prevent it from using other devices or tactics still makes it a threat. In March, it carried out long-range ballistic missile tests. And regional rivals say the deal is further emboldening Iran, already entangled in a number of conflicts. The biggest test of the deal so far happened last month, when the US extended the Iran Sanctions Act for the next decade, infuriating the Iranians. But a new challenge to the accord is coming up on the horizon. Incoming US President Donald Trump has labelled it a disaster and the worst deal ever negotiated, suggesting he could tip the balance in favour of an isolated Iran once again. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now by Professor Hushang Amir Ahmadi in New York. He's a former Iranian presidential candidate and now heads up the American Iranian Council. And from London, Paul Ingram. He's the executive director of a nuclear think tank, the British American Security Information Council. He's an expert on global nuclear disarmament and security. And with me here in the studio is Middle East analyst Ahmed al Burai, who's a lecturer at Istanbul Aydın University. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Paul Ingram, I'm going to start with you. Donald Trump might thank you. tear it up. Why shouldn't he tear it up? Well, there's a whole load of reasons, not least because the deal is good in its own right. But, but more than that, um, the nuclear deal came at a time when uh, many within the Ir Iranian society and, and within the Iranian government were looking to change the, the overall deal with the rest of the world to, to actually say uh, Iran is open for business, uh, Iran is a country that is worth dealing with, and Iranians themselves were, were, were looking for other means, uh, other soft power means to, to actually engage with the world. So it, it was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, that's, that's a gross generalization I've just put out because of course there were many within Iran who are deeply suspicious and those suspicions continue, but nevertheless, we have seen the country move onto a track of engagement which has uh, uh, wrong-footed some of the hardliners within Washington and, uh, and Israel. Okay, Hushang Amir Ahmadi, this has brought Iran in from the cold, they're open for business, you can talk to them. 
it's better than isolation. What do you think? Well, obviously, uh, we should support any uh, diplomatic move in uh, bringing uh, Iran back to the international community. But we could have done it in a different way. I think we could have done it more comprehensively. Unfortunately, the nuclear deal hasn't done that, except at the very margin of issues. And that's also very unstable. Everybody was hoping that the nuclear deal will open up Iran, and not just open up Iran to outside, but the outside to Iran as well. As I am speaking as an Iranian-American here in this country, nothing, absolutely nothing has changed for American citizens or green card holders as long as far as it goes uh, with Iran in terms of business. So unfortunately, it's a one-way street open that, that has opened, not a, a more comprehensive one. So again, that's the only thing that has happened after JCPOS is international trade, that Iran has become the purchaser, the consumers of the international goods in some certain areas, but it, hard, it has a hard time to sell except for oil and a few other uh, commodities. And again, they are, they are selling oil just because the international community needs it, right. uh, at, at least. But again, what I'm saying is the deal hasn't really uh, you know, helped the Iranian people. It has just uh, stayed at the level of trade and that trade so, okay. you know, supports on so, the sorry to interrupt a certain you. section Let, of let me Iranian, take what you said. Uh, sorry you to know, interrupt people. you, Hushang, I, and I, I need to keep moving this on. Let me take what you said. It hasn't really helped no. the Iranian people and expand on it with Ahmed al Burai. There's a feeling here in the region from many, from um, Sunni majority Arab states and others saying, you want to give these guys $100 billion and they increase their influence in Syria and they influence their, they increase their influence elsewhere. It, this deal doesn't help their people. It only helps Iran's empire building. Are you partial to that view? To be honest, what happened is very ironic because if you think about it the same way if you think about Assad when he crossed the line, the red line of Obama when he used the chemical weapons, the same thing. Uh, Obama told him that if you use the chemical weapon, you are a murderer, you are a brutal a killer, but if you don't, if you use other kind of weapons, it's okay. Now, what happened in the deal is the same thing. Let Iran not have a nuclear weapon, but still on, this, on the other hand, they give her the chance to unleash its dreams and ambitions in the whole region. If you think about the expansionist a mentality of the Iranians in Iraq, they're supporting their proxies in Yemen. They're supporting the people, the, their proxies as well in Syria. So the, what happened in the region after it's signing the deal was not a good thing for the whole people. The only thing in Obama's mind was Israel. They don't want Israel to be like, they want Israel to be, Israel security to be intact nobody can affect Israel the other hand they don't want to have this kind of nuclear competition they, like the other powers here in the region Saudi Arabia or Turkey would start thinking about if Iran has the nuclear weapon why don't we have one mm -hmm. so that's the, the main issue was but they, to be honest what happened later on it was not a stabilization in the region it was rather a destabilization of the whole destabilization region. in the region okay Paul I'm gonna let you come in in, in a moment but first let's have a quick reminder of the terms Iran had to abide by under the conditions of the deal. Here's Natalie Pohernan. As part of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Iran agreed to reduce its uranium stockpile to less than 300 kilograms, to cut down its uranium-enriched centrifuges from 19,000 to about 6,000 at its Fordo and Natanz enrichment sites, and to ship its uranium to Russia for processing. It's also opened up nuclear facilities to inspectors. Okay, so Paul, one year on, Iran has not cheated on any of those points. So do we need to be cutting it some slack here rather than criticizing like Ahmed is doing? Absolutely. I mean, what we have here is a situation that is ongoing and, and, dy and dynamic. Believe it or not, we live in the real world where people do deals as uh, President Trump, uh, as, as he will be on Friday, 
talks about a lot. Now, this deal would took, took a long time in the making because w the two sides were so far apart. This is, this is a deeply entrenched conflict. We're not going to have comprehensive solutions in two or three years' time. It, it takes generations for these, uh, the, these conflicts to heal. What the Iran nuclear deal was, was a sticky plaster solution to a serious problem around the probability of Iran going down the nuclear route. But it also opened up the possibility of new negotiations on much broader angles around human rights around the region and the rest of it. Now, this $100 billion, which incidentally is not a great deal of money in the scheme of things, it sounds like a, a, a lot of money, but it's about the same amount of money as this country, Britain, is about to spend on its nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's, it's one year's health spending in this country. It's a lot of money, but it's not that much money. In the end, what we're talking about is Iranian money that has been locked up for a while. And yes, the Iranians are doing all sorts of dodgy things in the region, but we're not going to actually get the Iranians on the Iranian regime on side by constantly knocking them over okay. the head so that hardliners in Tehran always win the domestic arguments within Iran. Okay. We need to be playing into the hands of the moderates okay. within Iran. Okay, good point. So, Ahmed, sticky plaster solution to a serious problem, but the sticky plaster is still stemming the bleeding. It's something rather than nothing, Ahmed. To be honest, at the very beginning, we were like cautiously optimistic about the deal and we thought that it's going to be in favor of the whole region. And everybody would be happy if Iran was like more open to the international community and we don't have these kind of human rights violations. But on the other hand, you would feel that they're not honest in the deal. We don't know. I don't have any factual basis about this, but I'm not sure that this kind of deal was tight enough to prevent or raise and the ambition of Iran to have the nuclear uh, mm -hmm. weapon. If you think about the other, some leaks and reports speaking about private places, again, I, I assert that I don't have any uh, factual basis for this, but it's still uh, media reports speaking about private or secret places where they can uh, so go you don't on trust with their them. proliferation. You, you don't trust them? No. Ho okay, Hushang, can Iran be trusted that They've given up. Yes. They, they've absolutely given up the ambitions to weaponize nuclear energy. This is uh, solely for peaceful purposes. Well, uh, obviously, uh, the U.S. Nobody has said that Iran had a program. Obviously, everybody has said that Iran had a program of weaponization, weaponizing until 2003, and thereafter, the U.S. intelligence agencies have said that they have. They had given up since then. So I don't know what Mr. John Kerry is talking about. If there was not a deal, Iran would build a bomb. I think that's, a, that's just a, a lie. I don't think that Iran was in the direction of building a bomb. Uh, and besides, if a country has ever been in that direction, it will never stop, regardless of whatever deal you make. I mean, North Korea is an example. Pakistan is an example. And there are many countries that had the intention at the end of the day, they got it. So if the world community thinks that Iran had the intention, and after all, the same leaders are there, uh, that intention must be there, and therefore Iran will build it. Well, I, think that, I don't think that they had that, and they don't have. But the problem with the nuclear deal is that President Obama uh, made really a straw man of the Iran's nuclear deal to build a legacy for himself. And he doesn't care what happens afterward, mm -hmm. just like Obamacare, who is going to be rejected, and the Iran nuclear deal very soon will be history, not just because Mr. Donald Trump is going to tear it into peace, but is going to make sure that Iran will not benefit from it. And at the end of the day, Iran will be forced to stop that uh, implementation process. So right. again, Hushak, Hushak, uh, let me, let me come in. I want to ask here. you a, a question <clears throat> before we go. I, I, I apologize. I, I want to come in. You know, you say Obama wants to pad his CV. There are many hawks in, in D.C., just what three, a three-hour Amtrak uh, train ride away from where you are right now. Many hawks in D.C. who have this weird um, mentality towards the deal right now. I'm going to quote you something from Michael Rubin from the Heritage Foundation. This is what he said. He said, what I'd like to see is them going along with the deal, he means the Trump administration, but subtly antagonizing the Iranians enough so that the Iranians want to scrap it. 
more non-nuclear sanctions, pushing the IAEA to inspect more, we can force them to be the ones to pull the trigger. What is going on with that mentality? Tell me, Hushang. Well, again, I mean, that is, is going to be official policy of the Trump administration. S keep the deal as a trap for Iran. Keep Iran in that nuclear trap deal. And then, on the periphery of the deal, create trouble for Iran, add more sanctions using human rights and terrorism, the regional stuff, Israel, as pretext to uh, add more and more of the sanctions, forcing Iran into, uh, in, into a situation where either it takes it or leaves. In either case, Iran would be a loser. That's the, the, the concept of the trap is. I believe that is the official policy, mm -hmm. what Mr. Rubin is saying. It's only unfortunate that Iran would have to get itself into that trap as opposed to really opening up to a larger, more comprehensive deal with the United States where everything was on the table, including the nuclear matter. Right. But unfortunately, that didn't happen and Iran is in the trap. Okay, Paul Ingram, just, just about enough time for a final comment here. The Inter International Crisis Group tries to put out fires. They say it would be unfathomable, the consequences, if the deal collapses. Isn't that a bit of an exaggeration? Well, it may be an exaggeration. Who knows? No, it Who is knows? not. We're sitting it's not going to collapse. It's just going to disappear. Idea of future. But, 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 but the, the, the attitude just described from Washington, which I would agree is what the Trump administration is likely to be going down, trying to get the Iranians to renege on the deal, shows absolutely no regard for the progressives within Iran or the Iranian people. It shows no regard for regional stability, and it shows no regard for global security. I think Obama has, uh, it, it is to be congratulated for the Iranian deal and his attempts to create a stronger a, a pluralist approach towards regional security in the Middle East. We need to be carrying on that approach rather than ripping it up and going back to the bad old ways that demonstrated a very poor outcome. I mean, all sorts of damage and wars and conflagration that we have seen in the past on much worse scale will, will, will come back. Mm -hmm. Final question for you, Ahmed, and I'm totally out of time, so 20 seconds, please. Can't Russia be some sort of counterbalance here? Because if the Trump administration is going to be friendly towards Russia, Iran's an ally of Russia, can't we find some sort of balance there? Yeah, I believe so. And I do believe that the, the coming pres president, the president-elect Trump, is not going to, to totally scrap the deal. He may be willing to... Uh, kind of renegotiate it, but uh, originally his a uh, a kind of a uh, close relation with Putin or the Russian uh, mm -hmm. government is going to make it easier with the uh, with the Iranian government. On the other hand, they have like a common goal, which is to keep the Syrian president in his uh, place. That will make a kind of a compromise between the three parties, and I believe that Russia would be a, a very influential player in this issue. Okay, gentlemen. Unfortunately time is our enemy. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Paul Ingram, Ahmed Al-Burai and Hushang Amir Ahmadi. Thanks so much. Thank you.